Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Chris Johnston who joins us to discuss his recent book, Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. Co-authored with Joanna Macy, Active Hope is about finding and offering our best response to the crisis of sustainability unfolding in our world. It starts by accepting that the challenges we face can be difficult even to look at. Climate change, the depletion of oil, economic collapse and the dieback of our natural world act together to create a planetary emergency of overwhelming proportions. Active Hope offers an approach that strengthens our capacity to face disturbing information and respond with unexpected resilience and creative power. Hello and welcome Chris Johnstone and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Pleasure Greg, Um, good to talk with you. Uh, Now we're here today to discuss um, your relatively new book that you have co-authored and it's called Active Hope, um, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy, Uh, fairly self-explanatory title, Uh, but perhaps before we dive into that, perhaps you could give uh, the listeners some background of uh, uh, you and your work and the journey that you've been on that's brought you to the the work that you do today and how the the book came about. Yes, certainly. Well, my background, I trained as a medical doctor and psychologist and worked for nearly 20 years in the UK health service as an addiction specialist. And my core interest and has been really for decades is the psychology of change and particularly what helps us rise to the occasion when we're facing challenges. And I've worked for more than 20 years with Joanna Macy, an American writer, workshop leader and activist who's now in her 80s. And Joanna, over 30 years ago in the late 1970s, she developed an empowerment approach that's called The Work That Reconnects. And the goal of this is really to help enliven and empower responses to the global crisis we face. And she's been a really big influence on me. And what I've been delighted about and feel a sense of privilege around really is that I've worked very closely with her over the four years that we worked on producing this book. She living in the States and me living in Britain. And we had a a long series of Skype conversations. We actually had over 100 hours of conversation over Skype. And through that, we wrote this book together. Okay. Now, the book itself, um, I personally picked it up because I'm deeply concerned about the direction that we've been going in um, as a species and what we're doing to the planet. I've probably been like that all my life, to be honest, but uh, things are not getting better. And there's a lot of literature out there warning us um, of a bazillion different things that are out of control and going wrong. Uh, There's a lot less literature that's offering some light at the end of the tunnel a way out, a way to deal with things, and Active Hope, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading, by the way, um, is a really useful tool, much needed, I think, uh, in these times, to give people the encouragement um, to do something, however little it is, but just to take steps forward and not just exist in what you in the book call the deadened response uh, to the global crisis, which is a great danger in itself that because it causes us to do nothing. And I suppose the message of the book is summed up in the title. It's not just hope, it's active hope. Exactly that, exactly that, that there are different ways of thinking about hope. And one way of thinking about hope is in terms of probability. It's an assessment of the likelihood of things going the way they, the way we want them to do to. So we feel hopeful about a situation if we're think it's likely to go well and unhopeful um, if we if if we're less optimistic and a lot of people look at global issues and don't feel at all optimistic about how things are going but even more so the mental health foundation did a big survey of over 2,000 people looking at their emotional responses to global issues and the commonest response was a sense of powerlessness, that people look at what's going on and and feel like there's nothing I can do, you know, nothing I can do that's really going to make much difference. And when people feel powerless like that, there's a sense of resignation, closing down and closing off to um, to the situation. And so what 
really Joanna's work has been about and, and, and my work too is when we face disturbing information, when we face information that's depressing to look at, um, rather than weighing up the chances of are we hopeful or are, are we not, the, 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 there's another side of hope, the second side of hope, which is really about what do we hope for? What do we desire? What is it we long for? What is it we hope will happen? And you see that as setting your navigational coordinates. You see that as setting the direction to move in. And then the next question is, what can I do to move that way? So we think of active hope as having three main stages. The first stage is to take in a clear view of reality. So you're just seeing things as they are, both the the, the fantastic, wonderful aspects and also the disturbing ones. And then the second step is just to say, what do I hope for? What, how do I hope things will go? But then also, and then this is the real key, the third part is about being an active participant in the story of helping that to happen. And when we do that, you know, we don't, we have no guarantee that it will all work out well. But what, um, what we can know is that we're putting the full weight of our lives behind the outcome that we prefer will happen. You know, putting the weight of our lives behind our preferred version of the future. Yes, well, people tend to forget that if you choose not to decide, you've still made a choice, and that we do make choices every day, and so some of those are to do nothing. And when you realise that, um, you know, that life isn't certain, it's just uncertainty, that can be quite empowering as well. And you can then start to make choices consciously, um, because either way, as you say in the book, uh, the situation that we're in, we encourage people to look at realistically, it is happening. And, uh, you know, so, so it's a case of how you face up to it and uh, how you deal with it. Exactly, exactly that. And I, and I think well, one of the things we write about is that there are different ways of looking at what's going on. And um, we, we think of them as different stories, different stories we can tell ourselves about how things are on planet Earth at the beginning of the 21st century. And one story is that things are going fine and really what we need is to get the economy to grow even bigger and to, you know, to get more jobs and higher salaries and economic development. And that is the dominant story amongst um, certainly most world leaders, corporate leaders, uh, it, that, that business as usual story. And, and, and the defining assumption is that we don't really need to change the way we're going. We just kind of need more of the same and to do it better and faster. And, and, and that's what's leading to, it's basically leading us over the edge of a cliff. Uh, this idea that we need to have economic growth where the more we grow, the more resources we consume and the more waste we produce without really looking at, well, what are the limits to that? You know, that basically we're entering an age where we're already, part, most of the, the cheaper, more available oil has already been used up. And what we're left with is the oil that's difficult to get hold of that might be miles beneath the, the ocean surface or um, in, in or poorer quality oil like the tar sands in in Canada, and um, so, and, and that there's plenty of other resources that we're we're coming to to the limits of. But also, just the more we grow, the more waste we produce. And I think that the the amount of waste produced, for example, in North America each year, um, would produce a equivalent to a rows of of um, rubbish trucks going round the world several times. I mean, it's just absolutely astounding the amount of rubbish that we produce. But also, we don't really know what to do with it. We're creating so much. So, But as well as the rubbish we can see, there's a rubbish that we can't see in terms of the waste products that we're pumping out into the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, tons every year for each person, certainly in um, Western Europe and, and North America. And, I mean, it, the idea that we need to grow more in a way that's producing more... Um, more waste products that are, are destabilizing the, um, you know, the, 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 the climate. I mean, it's, it's kind of like um, we're just not looking at where we're heading. That, that, there's, that, that we're increasingly becoming dominated by a very, very short-term approach to thinking. And certainly when it comes to economic transactions, they're now occurring even in um, matters of seconds, this idea of automated trading of, of shares, 
happenings, you know, shares can be bought and sold in a matter of seconds, not even by humans, but by um, controlled by computer programs. It governed by very, very short term um, deci decisions are made on basically what's going to make profit between the morning and the afternoon. I, I once spoke to somebody who's an economist for one of the major banks in the city of London, and she was in their long range planning department. And long range planning for them was looking as far ahead as three months in the future. And how, how can we navigate in a world where the consequences of our decisions can last, you know, not just decades or even hundreds of years, but for example, with some of the toxins we're producing, they have effects that will still be around even hundreds of millions of years into the future. I mean, it's just a completely different span of time. So if the consequences of our decisions are long term, but we're only looking at the short term consequences for actually making the decisions, what's happening is we're blinding ourselves to the hazards that we're heading into. And I think of it as just like the Titanic, really.